Welcome to Midnight Streaming with Jess and Julia. I'm Jess. And I'm Julia. So we want to start off first by introducing ourselves a little bit, uh, and then introduce the show that we're going to talk about in our first series on the podcast, which is Babylon Berlin. So Jess and I are, col- are in college. We're roommates, and I'm studying political science and history, and... I'm studying theater and sociology. And we're doing a recap for our first episode because even on my third watch, I'm still noticing and understanding new things. So a lot of our questions and plot points that we discuss are things that Jess had as questions as a new viewer. Yeah, so, (laughs) well, let's start off with Julia wanted me to watch this show for a little while. Um, She had been talking about it. And I don't know, at first I was kind of... Not against it, but I was... Well, you thought it was a documentary. I did. I, I don't know. For, for some reason, the way that you talked about it, I just... I thought it was just some kind of, like, boring boring documentary on the Weimar Republic. And I was like, eh, I, I don't do, know. I do watch a lot of boring documentaries, but this is not one of them. Yeah. Um, it literally took her just putting it on one night. And I was kind of forced to watch it. And I'm glad that you did, because... It was good, and we watched a lot the first yes. night. I held her captive in the living room, and then every night after that, we watched until, what, 3 a.m., 4 a.m.? Yeah, it was, like, every night. We were very, very into it. I think we finished all three seasons in how long? A couple weeks. Yeah, a couple of weeks. Um, but, yeah, I definitely had points throughout the show where I was a little confused. It was definitely very helpful having somebody who knows a lot about history and political science sitting next to me so I could just ask questions and pause when I needed to. So we kind of figured we would do that for you a little bit. So Julia is going to be taking the lead a lot um, in this episode because she is going to be able to provide a lot of political and historical context, which I found really helpful. So we figured you would find really helpful. And this episode is going to be basically a recap. And then in future episodes, we're going to get much deeper into the weeds about the themes, the characters, the plot, all of that. Yeah, definitely more of a deep dive because something that we realized is after we finished the show, every night we would just sit in our living room until like 3 a.m. just talking about anything and everything related to the show, just like a deep analysis. Like we would just go, yeah, on and on and on um, until one night Julia was like, why don't we record this for people? So that's what we're doing now. (laughs) Um, And hopefully you enjoy it. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. Other people, other than just the two of us, find some joy in our analysis. But let's start with a recap. So we're going to start with season one and two as they appear on Netflix. But when the show was released in Germany, um, those two seasons were just one cohesive season. So we're going to talk about that first as a whole. So the first big plot point that sort of introduces us into the world of the show is Gary and chasing down blackmail porn. Um, so this is like the introductory plot. This is the whole reason he's in Berlin. His father, Engelbert Rath, which is a great name, um, <laughs> is very concerned that Conrad Adenauer, the mayor of Cologne, is going to be blackmailed before the election. So he sends Gary in, um, from his job as a police officer in Cologne to Berlin to track down this pornography ring, um, find the film, and destroy it. This is a vehicle for the larger story, I think, and it also introduces us to a lot of the important characters like Edgar, the Armenian, um, and he eventually, we find out he is like sort of the mastermind of this of this, of this blackmail porn plot. Um, yeah. He kind of uses it as like a political tool, and that's where he gets most of his power from. He's kind of able to manipulate people through this blackmail that he has. And this introduces us to like the trio of Gary and Dr. Schmidt and the Armenian, and they have this sort of mysterious connection that still is not fully um, explained to us. And... In the final resolution of this specific plot point, Garion finds the film um, in the Armenians Club Mocha FD. He watches it on a screen and he finds out that it's not Conrad Adenauer who is in the footage, it's his own father. And so this is the reason that he decides to stay in Berlin. I think this is like a point of sort of disgust with with not only his father, but with the kind of corruption of the system. And this is the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back and the reason that he decides to leave Cologne and his sort of former life for good. Yeah, because he was only supposed to be in Berlin on kind of a temporary basis. Like a you know, week. Yeah, he was only like staying in hotels and then he eventually, you know, finds a more permanent residence and starts this whole new life in Berlin. 
So our other main character is Charlotte, who we are also introduced to through the police department. She's actually first introduced on screen as a sex worker. And there's kind of this day job, night job dichotomy. So at night, she works at this club uh, as a sex worker. And during the day, she kind of works odd jobs at the station. And through this, she becomes interested and involved with the case involving the train, which is kind of the primary point of season one, really like the, the driving factor is this case with a train that most of the characters become involved with. Then through this case, um, Gary and Charlotte, who are our two main characters, kind of become intertwined. Um, so Charlotte kind of starts doing her own investigating, even though, you know, she just kind of does odd jobs and is supposed to work um, with the photos in the homicide department. But as she becomes more interested, she decides to kind of go off on her own without any clearance. They have that awesome first meeting. Oh, yeah. A very nice meet I cute. the elevator. Where, where they, they mix up the pictures. The pictures of severed limbs and, and pornography. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the next, the big plot point, um, as Jess mentioned, is the train, which I'll try to explain it in like the most concise way possible. Basically, there's there's three groups that have interest in this train that's the red fortress which are the trotskyists they're expats from the soviet union living in berlin um, and they're led by kardikov then there's svetlana who um, is also a russian expat pretending to be a trotskyist and also pretending to be a right-wing nationalist but really she wants the gold for herself um, and then the final person is um, nisan and by extension the right-wing nationalists who is using the his company, Nissan AG, as a front to get chemical weapons into the country and smuggle them to the um, the Black Reichsbar, which is illegally building arms in the in in Germany. So Svetlana um, wants the gold for herself. She's using Kardikov, who is trying to smuggle the gold to Trotsky in Istanbul. Um, so in order to get the gold, when the train arrives in Berlin, she sells them out to the Soviet embassy. And the entire Red Fortress is assassinated, except for Kardikov, who is like the Rasputin of his day, keeps evading death. Um, and then finally, she uses Nissan as a front. He's importing these chemical weapons. He doesn't really know what she wants to do with the train outside of the chemical weapons. Um, and eventually, she kind of outsmarts him, and she gets the train um, to to Paris, where we see her at the end of the season. Um, and the... The final sort of plot point is that the Black Reichsvar, who's using Nissan to get chemical weapons into the country, they're trying to make illegal weapons um, against the clause in the Treaty of Versailles that says that Germany is not allowed to create a new, stronger military. Yeah, this was definitely the part that I was confused about um, because it is very much entwined with the political culture of the time. So I remember having to pause kind of frequently and be like, wait, what? what do they want to do? What, what's, what party are they in? Um, so thank God for Julia, the, yeah. um, hi- history expert sitting next to me. You hear like Benda throughout the whole first two seasons being like the League of Nations is going to investigate this. This is against the Treaty of Versailles. So he is like very concerned. This is a serious violation. So this is like a, br- a really important plot point politically and within the framework of the show. Um, and that brings me kind of more into detail with the Black Reichsvar plot. Um, basically, this is this is Bruno's plot. He's um, working with the right wing nationalists to create a shadow army of the Reich. They want to overthrow the Republic, arrest major democratic figures and replace them with the Kaiser, as we see in this sort of like kind of silly fantasy scene where they're they're planning this uh, coup called Operation Prongertag, um, where they're going to assassinate all of these Weimar officials and even a French official as well. This is Bruno's main plot point. He's involved, and we find out that's why he was so suspicious of Garion at the beginning, because Bruno is afraid that people at the police station are on to him. They know that he's working with this like illegal um, shadow army. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how we see the whole plot with a black, black Reichsvar um, entwined with Bruno's character before we even really know what's going on. You know, because Bruno is a character that you kind of trust, but not completely. And you can sense there's something going on behind the scenes before you even know about his involvement with the plot. Um, and he's suspicious of Garion, and you're wondering if you should be suspicious of him. And then later, he's suspicious of Stefan, who, unfortunately, he is actually the one investigating Bruno for Benda. 
And once Bruno finds out, that gets him killed, which I was very upset about. I like Stefan a lot. Yeah. The show kind of, like, leads you astray. They're like, he's doing all these cute things for Charlotte, and then he's immediately murdered. That was terrible. Like, he, he was such a good and pure character, which... They always die. I guess that's why he had to die, but it still hurt, <laughs> you know? Um, so the coup is thwarted by um, Garion and Benda. Benda essentially is trying to arrest all of these major figures in the German, um, in the in the Reichswehr, which is the army, um, which includes General Seegers, all of these like high-ranking officials. And Hindenburg himself, President Hindenburg, steps in and protects them. Um, and he, they eventually, they don't go to jail. They're not punished um, for the importation of these illegal chemical weapons. And it, this all like comes to a head in Operation Prongertag, in which they try to assassinate Minister Streisman and Minister Briand, the French foreign minister and the German foreign minister. And Garion thwarts the coup. Um, but this is in, like the undercurrent of all of this is very ominous because we know that. We know that it won't succeed, but also we know what is coming and that's worse. And so you're kind of rooting for Gary and to stop them. But at the same time, you have to take a step back and think, oh, my God, like what if this had happened? Maybe we could have avoided what was coming in the next in the next 10 years. Yeah, it's a little bit of dramatic irony, which we'll definitely talk more about later um, and analyze a little deeper just because, you know, obviously we know the history of it and we know what's coming, but, you know, Gary and still the protagonist. You're still going to root for him, even though you know that everything that he's doing is pretty much for nothing. So kind of as a little subplot, we have Helga and Moritz, um, specifically when they arrive in Berlin, because prior to her actual physical entrance into the show, Helga's kind of this mysterious figure. You know, we don't know too much about her. We know that she's, to some extent... Garion's lover, he does say um, in the scene where he confesses to the priest that he's in love with his brother's widow, um, but really only hear her very briefly over the phone and hear Garion's letters to her until she actually arrives. Um, and that's clearly very much a surprise to him that mm -hmm. she comes to Berlin. She, Her character is kind of interesting because... I feel like we were talking about how a lot of people criticize her for being kind of bland or boring. Um, but I feel like her existence as a character serves more to represent Garion's past and his trauma. Um, like she's largely there to push his development along, especially his mental development. And Normally his... I don't like female characters who solely exist to further a man's development, but yeah. <laughs> because they have a lot of other great female characters in the show, I'll give them a pass. We'll, we'll let it slide. We'll let it slide. <laughs> um, uh, she also introduces the storyline with his brother, which kind of leads into a greater conversation with uh, Dr. Schmidt, who he eventually kind of seeks therapy from. Um, and it just opens up a conversation about... Garion's mental health, his PTSD, what happened with his brother on the battlefield, which is very interesting, especially the uh, flashback sequences with that, which we will definitely get into in a lot more detail later because there is a lot contained within that. Helga essentially personifies shame for Garion, which mm -hmm. I don't think bodes well for a healthy relationship. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> so then another major plot line is the May Day protest. Um, or this takes place on International Workers' Day, May 1929. The communists are going to have this massive protest in the streets, and we see Chief of Police Zorgabel tell the police officers that their job is to protect democracy. He sort of subtly gives them permission to open fire if things get, get rowdy with the communists. And, of course, it does. Communists are shot. There are a couple of women that we see, like Garion and, uh, and Bruno, take care of who are innocent bystanders, and they're shot, and they both die. Um, and... Later, we actually see Garion covering this up, taking the side of his institutions, but um, Zorgabel covers up the, uh, the the brutality and he blames it on the communists. And so this kind of leads us directly into the plot line where in which Benda is assassinated. Benda essentially takes the fall for Zorgabel's actions and the Nazis who really want to kill Benda for um, for what we see as political purposes, they blame it on the communists. And Fritz and Otto are introduced by this plot point. They pretend to be communists. Um, and at first, we believe them. Fritz gets involved with Greta, who is uh, Charlotte's friend and Benda's maid. 
and they use her as a vessel through which to assassinate Benda. They pretend that Fitz, Fritz has been murdered by the political police, which is Benda's organization, um, and they convince her to plant a bomb in Benda's house. And eventually we see, you know, she goes to the train station. She tries to escape Berlin because she knows that she's just committed an assassination. And she sees Fritz and Otto at the train station dressed in their full Nazi regalia um, and realizes the mistake that she's made. She tries to go back to the house and it's too late. And by that point, uh, Benda and his daughter Margo are dead. Yeah, and that's interesting because it kind of represents the end of the chance for Germany to go down a better path. And I think Greta herself, and more specifically her innocence, the fact that she's so naive, I feel like she kind of represents the German people as a whole. I mean, she also kind of represents like people using their their emotions instead of their their morality or their their logic to make decisions, to make major life and death decisions, which is one of the reasons that the political situation got as bad as it did. Um, I think Benda is like representative. He's like a pillar of the Weimar system. He he truly believes in democracy. And even though sometimes he'll make questionable decisions, it's it's almost always in service of this democracy that he believes Germany can can uphold. Um, and we know that's pretty much already rotted at the core. And so his death is sort of the death of the potential for um, for the political system to change, for constitutional democracy to be upheld. And it's going to be violence from here on out. So that leads us into the climax of the first season or seasons one and two on Netflix, um, which kind of brings us to the end of the plot with a train case and the Black Reichswar, uh, in which Charlotte and Garion find out about the plan of the Reichswar to take over the train, obviously take the poison gas that's inside it, and they go and try to stop it. Um, within this, we see um, Bruno try to run the two off the road and attempt to murder both of them, in which Charlotte nearly drowns and Garion has to save her life. That's just important because it's a huge character turning point for both of them. Yeah, and it's interesting that that happens at the same time. It's kind of like contrasted with Benda's assassination. And both stories are so engrossing that you kind of forget that the other one has happened. And so the the next episode starts and you're like, oh my god, I forgot she was drowning. Yeah. Oh wait, she's almost dead. Yeah, because there's just so much happening at once. Um, so... Eventually, Garion makes it and he stops the Black Reichsvar from getting to the train, um, and in which we see the death of Bruno. With the help of my favorite characters, Henning and Sherwinsky. Oh, I love them. They're great. They stop the train, and the way that Bruno dies is like the most fantastic way for him to die, because he's he's an antagonist, but he's not a villain, and I think it's it's indicative of the fact that he caused his own downfall, his own prejudices caused his own downfall. Um, and we see Garion, like, they're shooting at each other. Garion has one bullet left in the chamber. That bullet pierces the the back of the train car filled with gas. Bruno's sitting there. He thinks he got away with it as the train, like, leaves and gun goes off into the Soviet Union. And we see him light up a cigarette. The spark catches on the on the gas, and the whole train car explodes. And I think that was just, like, the awesome way for Bruno to go out in kind of, like, a flame of glory. In the last episode, um, it's implied that the train with the gold, which, interestingly enough, the train itself is made of gold. There's no gold actually on the train. Garion did a little art history and uh, recognized that in the painting. He really dissected it. I was impressed, <laughs> actually. That was, I remember, like, the way I gasped when I saw that, like, when, like, the paint, like, chipped off of the train, I was like... No. I had forgotten that, actually. There's so many details that, like, are, there's so much going on that I forgot all these really important details. But that's an awesome That was insane. When you image. find out the gold is not actually gold, that was crazy. But anyways, um, so this train made of gold um, eventually gets to Paris and to Svetlana. Who's wearing an awesome outfit. And then Kartikov is there. Which is interesting. Um, he looks clean for the first time in the whole series. He does. Series. Poor Kartikov, who's always on the brink of death, is now in a nice suit and is, you know, finely dressed and looks clean and nice and well put together. Um, I don't, I'm, it, it's, it's weird. I'm not exactly sure why he's there. That's very, it's ambiguous. I don't know if he's, is he mad at her? Are they together? 
because he's a he's a fervent Trotskyist, so I can't imagine that he would suddenly give all of that up and just and just decide to be a gentleman wearing a tuxedo in a Paris cabaret. But he doesn't seem very mad at her. And also, like, why is he in that fancy cabaret wearing a fancy tuxedo? Where'd the money come from? Like, does he have the gold? Did it's he not... split it with Svetlana? I'm 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 confused. They leave that very vague. It's not very Trotskyist of him. No, definitely not. But anyways, she gets the gold. And we kind of talked about what the train represents and how it seems to be this overarching theme of how individual action can't really stop anything. We know what happens historically. Um, and just to clarify, we don't mean like individual action doesn't matter in anything. It means like by this point, by 1929, the individual actions, the choices had already been made that were setting the trajectory. And we see by this point that so many people had decided to make bad decisions that even a few people trying to make good decisions like like Benda and Garion, it's it's powerless against like this rising tide of exactly. violence. It's it, it's a bullet heading in one direction. You know, it shows us where we're going and the fact that we're past the point of no return, pretty much. Yeah, and the train represents that. All of these people try to stop the train. They try to stop the bad things that are on the train. And essentially, they're powerless to stop it. Moving on to season three, which is personally my favorite season. We start off season three with the film studio murder. Um, the Gostoni brothers, who are two Hungarian brothers, um, that in the first um, episode of the series, one of their tongues is cut out by, by Edgar the Armenian. Um, because they were selling him bootleg liquor. So that's a really disgusting scene, and it's it stuck in my head. So I remembered who these guys are. It's a very appropriate response. I, I, th- I think, um, personally, everyone in the show needs anger management therapy. We were like, we, when we heard that one of the Gostoni brothers, the one whose con- tongue was cut out, we were like, why is he talking so weird? It sounds so bizarre. And then it hit both we of us. We realized, we're like, oh, the tongue. Like, it, it took us a while to put two and two together. So Edgar um, is the one who cut out the guy's tongue and his partner, Walter Weintraub, has just gotten out of prison. They're financing this movie and the Gostoni brothers, as revenge, are trying to, to sabotage it so that they lose a million dollars that they've invested. The main actress, Betty Winter, and her two replacements, Tilly and then later Vera, are all murdered by who we later find out is the brothers. Um, and side note, Tilly and Vera are both romantically connected to our, for our two main characters, Gary and Charlotte, respectively. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't think about that until you mentioned it, but yeah. Yeah. And then Esther Kasabian, who is Edgar's wife, is also involved in the film. She essentially replaces all of these main actresses. And she's she's interesting. She's not like super important to the overall plot, but she drives a lot of like the sub the subplots and like the, the themes of the season. Yeah. So this case is definitely important to Charlotte's character development because we kind of see her finally able to show off her investigative skills as she's like finally becoming an actual investigator. She does her exam and we see it like right next to Garion um actually using the Gannat method in the field at the the film studio set. Um so it's really cool to see that like juxtaposed next to each other and that they both really have this talent for investigation. So the investigation itself um ends up completely manipulated by Ulrich. Um Ulrich, he works in forensics which is super important he thinks that his work isn't being appreciated so he decides to prove a point um to doctor the evidence he also talks to the gasoni brothers and encourages them to continue he wants to draw out the case and he ends up throwing the investigators basically on a wild goose chase just by messing with the evidence throwing them in a bunch of different directions that are far away from the actual you don't conclusion think the, to the case. The criminal telepathy was going to work. Oh, the criminal telepathy! That all was... of the experts are in Vienna. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Where they all they all just start screaming. That scene is so funny for no reason. I know a lot of people don't like that scene, but I think it's I think it's referencing like a lot of the like noir movies of the day and like just the the overacting and I think it's hilarious. Yeah, it like it makes sense why it's there. It's just it's so strange. It's so odd. It's a little like, you know, light criminal telepathy to pull you out of the the constant ominous Nazi march. I would yeah. say. Mhm. Just a little we'll sprinkle in a little telepathy just for fun. A little treat. So, 
another kind of minor plot point this season is Moritz, who looks to have grown five years in the three months since uh, the first season yeah, that is taking place. They mess up the timeline just a little bit there. <laughs> Um, but he sort of slowly gets drawn into the Hitler youth. So he's like this Catholic kid living in Berlin, which is not a Catholic city. Um, he's hanging out with sort of like the non-cool kids. He's like with this Catholic youth group and these little, uh, Nazi party youth organization members are kind of taunting him and they're like, come join us. You'll be cool. And so it's sort of like a classic situation of being drawn into like the cool kids, except in this case, the cool kids are, uh, the Nazi <laughs> Nazis, yeah, yeah, they're Just Nazis. Nazis, um, and we see him sort of rejecting his mother's sort of traditional values, her values of like trying to seek out a stable partner to support her. Um, he's very judgmental of her choice to be with Alfred Neeson, and all of these events in his life sort of transpire to to push him away from his more traditional Catholic family and to this like new ideology. So another major player in season three is Cattleback. And we're introduced to him in, you know, seasons one and two, but he's more of a side character. You know, he just kind of lives He's at, hilarious, though. I love him. Yeah. <laughs> but he just kind of lives at Mrs. Benka's with Gary and He doesn't really contribute all too much. He doesn't um, air out his room, ever. No, he doesn't. No. <laughs> um, but he really becomes very important in season three. Um... So Kyle Beck is a journalist um, who is intent on exposing the Black Reichsbar. Um, because of this and because of everything that he's written, he ends up being targeted by the Nazis. Um, there's a very interesting scene in which Mrs. Benka hides him in a wardrobe, which I think is kind very... Of like behind the wardrobe in yeah. another section of her house. Mm -hmm. But we were talking about how it's a very strange sense of foreshadowing. Like, obviously we know what happens with the Nazis and the Holocaust later on. Kattelbeck's Jewish too, that's important. Yeah. And the scene where he kind of has to rely on like the random kindness of strangers is, I thought it was like an homage. I know, I don't think we're gonna see up to that point in the series, but it's kind of a, a really sad, but kind of gentle, like beautiful reminder that there, there were some, there was some humanity there that people were willing to put themselves on the line for others. So in order to keep himself safe, he actually ends up hiding uh, with Garion at his apartment. You um, see Garion like telling him, you know, the police are looking for you. Went is looking for you. So make sure you're hiding. You yeah. see him kind of giving him a tip, even though he doesn't really have any reason to, besides just kind of personal loyalty to him and also belief that, you know, people should be able to have a free press. Yeah, Garion kind of becomes a very good ally for him. Um, but that definitely sets up an interesting dynamic because now Moritz is living with Garion in his apartment. Um, and as we know, now Moritz is involved with the Hitler youth and the Nazis currently want Kattelbeck dead. So... Kattelbeck has a really funny scene where he says like, you know, he's a great kid, but I disagree with his politics. So another, probably like one of the major plot points of the season is the stock market. And I assume everybody listening kind of knows what's coming with the stock market. This is September, 1929. Um, the stock market is going to crash in October 1929. So Neeson sends out his um, his assistant guy to go and interview all kinds of people living in Berlin. And one of the people he interviews is is Bohm, who works at the police station, which is kind of an interesting way of connecting everybody. But he finds out that that people, anybody from like workers to police officers, are investing multiple times of their life's lifelong net worths into the stock market under the mistaken belief that it can never fail because the American stock market is climbing and climbing and climbing. Um, and just for background, um, Germany owes reparations to the other European powers at this time under the Treaty of Versailles. And the way that it was working was America was making all of this money in their in industries in the stock market. They were giving Germany the money to pay off the reparations and they were giving that money to Europe. So when the American economy crashes, the German economy crashes even harder. So that's sort of foreshadowed the entire season. Neeson starts to realize what's about to happen um, and he tries to get people on board with him. A lot of people like laugh at him and they, they tell him that's impossible, it's never going to happen. Um, but he decides to bet against the stock market anyway um, and bet that the German economy is about to fail. And he tries to use this as a means by which to create a new Germany, essentially the new political and economic system. Also involved in this is, is Helga, the breakdown of Helga and Garion's relationship. Um, 
Gary oh, and yes. our favorite couple. So yeah. healthy. <laughs> Gary is starting to see Dr. Schmidt more. He starts to have really awful feelings towards Helga. Helga panics and she by chance kind of meets Alfred Neeson and eventually gets together with him, which we kind of see her doing it intentionally. Like she dresses up a lot to have lunch with him. I think she is looking for somebody who can take care of her financially, which I don't I don't blame her. She's a woman in the 1920s. Um, and she she becomes pregnant and she tells Gary that she's had a miscarriage and that it's too late. She's with Neeson now. He needs to get over it. And then later in the in the last episode or the second to last episode, we and Charlotte see her having an abortion. So that's like another interesting plot point kind of wrapped up in the rise of Alfred Neeson as like an industrialist. Now he's going to be one of the richest men in the country. So, you know, kind of good for Helga, I guess. Yeah. It's also interesting to see Garion's reaction to everything because, you know, kind of throughout the season, we see we see the relationship kind of start to splinter and. Um, you know, it, it just something seems to be going on between the two of them. And I think it kind of comes with the fact that Garion is reckoning with his past now. They have a couple of really weird sex scenes. Yeah, very strange, very uncomfortable. You know, kind of as we talked about before, Helga to him is representative of his past. The shame and the regret that he feels with everything that happened. You know, his brother on the battlefield. And could he have saved him? Should he have saved him? And then when he went back... You know, obviously he was in love with his wife and, you know, is she his, was she ever his to lose? So I think, well, obviously he's upset because there is this love for Helga. There's an interesting sense of acceptance where he's kind of able to let her go and move on. He, he has this line when he's meeting with Dr. Schmidt. He says something along the lines of, I can't lose her because she was never mine. He recognizes that she he doesn't own her. Exactly. You know, she She's an independent person even though for him she's like she's existed only in this kind of secret bubble in his childhood home for their entire lives and now they have to reckon with the responsibilities of an adult relationship and that's clearly outside the realm of of their maturity in this in this particular relationship. Yeah. There's definitely a lot there and we will probably dedicate a whole episode into going very in-depth about that because we've talked for hours and hours about yes. the relationship dynamic between him and Helga and then how Charlotte plays a role in that and how he moves on and what each of them represents. So Point being, I'm rooting for those two kids. I think they're going to stay together Yeah, forever. Helga and Garion? Yes. Oh, they're yeah. going to be together forever. Yeah, definitely a very strong and healthy relationship. Yes. Absolutely. Anyways. <laughs> so... The, one of the biggest overarching storylines of the whole season is Colonel Went, who is, like, a fantastic... He's, like, he's pretty close to, like, a true villain. He's got this, like, awesome scar on his face. He has these really cold blue eyes that he always... He's always looking very uh, vacant and scary. But we find out that he was behind the entire um, Benda murder plot, and he's trying to cover it up. And this is, like, a great... Um, encapsulation of the ways in which these right-wing nationalists and, like, the aristocratic right kind of piggybacked onto the Nazis and used their street muscle to accomplish their own political ends. And eventually, like, they, they tacitly aided their rise. So they funded them, they gave them all these kinds of jobs, they legitimized them, trying to use them for their own purposes, and eventually they kind of were subordinated to the Nazis. But this is what Fritz and Otto, this is their mission. They were trying to assassinate Benda at the behest of Wendt. Um, and Wendt, to cover up this murder, he kills... A couple more people and he kills Fritz and um, he has Greta's execution expedited and then Otto dies in a sort of separate incident. It turns out that the whole reason that he's doing this is to become the new chief of police, to kick Zorgabel out of his seat and become the new chief of police. And he ends up not getting the position because he verbally incriminates himself to Garion, who is a police officer, who is recording him. Um, and that's an awesome scene where we see Went being passed over for this promotion to the chief of police. Oh, um, so funny. He's like shaking. I mean, I, I don't think it'll make much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. I don't think. I think things are probably going in a bad direction regardless. But that is pretty satisfying. Yeah, just it made me feel good just to see him get so upset being passed over for the position that he thought he had in the bag. Um, and then another important part of his whole plotline is... Mrs. Benka and um, Marie-Louise Seegers, 
So him and, and Marie Louise have like this weird, I can't really tell if it's a romantic or sexual flirtation or They're if it's like, just like a weird. It's like an intellectual flirtation. It's, 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 they appreciate each other's minds and their intellects. I think it's, he's attracted to her though. I don't know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how it plays out. Because the two of them have this kind of like bantery thing. It's so cute. Like she's trying to like disrupt his political plots and he's trying to overthrow the Republic. It's so romantic. It's very romantic. And she and Mrs. Benka end up by chance working together to provide documents for Cattleback to write, to finish his story on the on the Black Reichsbart while he's hiding um, from the Nazis and essentially from Went. So that's another um, important kind of wrap-up point of the season. And then another point is uh, the relationship between Charlotte and Garion. We're going to get much, much more into the relationship, but they do have a really lovely scene at Graf's birthday party where they kiss, and then their relationship status is kind of ambiguous for a couple of episodes, and then by the end of it, I think it's fairly clear that that they are openly admitting to their love for each other, their feelings for each other. Yeah, I'm definitely interested to see where they're going to take it, especially because in the next season... They're skipping ahead a couple of years. So I'm wondering how they're going to approach it. There's definitely a couple of different theories floating around, but I don't know. I kind of just want to see what they're going to do. They're no Gary and and, uh, Helga, but... Oh, yeah, no. Gary and Helga are definitely a power couple. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys. So thank you for tuning in to our first ever episode. I know this one was kind of very straightforward and a lot of... Julia explaining historical context. But yeah, most of our conversations while watching the show were just me pausing and being like, hey, what, what is this? Who, who are they? What does this mean? I'm confused. Um, so I hope we were able to provide a little bit of context to some of the more confusing plot points and character points within the show. Moving forward, we're going to do more of a deep dive into some of the things that we talked about today. Um, a more thematic analysis, um, talking about analysis. yeah, more specific things. Um, the next topic we're going to touch on is the use of suspense and dramatic irony. Kind of how the show uses our own knowledge and lack of knowledge of history against us to create this really interesting, dark, ominous tone to a lot of the show. So thank you guys so much for listening. If you have any questions comments, feel free to email us at midnightstreamingpodcast at gmail.com and follow us on social media. We have an Instagram. It's at midnightstreaming. Thanks for staying up with us. See you next time. Mm-hmm.